today I'm going to be presenting, uh, we're going to be presenting about Alice. Um, specifically, we wanted to present about um, the cultural impact of Alice. Um, on the other hand, uh, what Japan, how Japan has impacted Alice as a concept, as a symbol. Um, I'm Kata, uh, I'm Alex, I'm an artist, I'm a writer, I'm an enthusiast for Alice in Wonderland. This is actually uh, a family thing. Whole family is all interested in Alice in Wonderland. We love it. We're super interested. Um, and my co-host, Gabe, is just as interested. So feel free to introduce yourself, Gabe. Uh, hello, I'm Gabe, also known as Bakakun on the internet, and I am a small-time YouTuber who has made a few videos on Alice-related subjects. Yeah. And that's about it. Yeah. Alice-related subjects. That is true. So... We're going to be covering Alice. We're going to be covering the Alice. Are you ready for the Alice? Gabe, are you ready for the Alice? I am, in fact, ready. I... We're ready for the Alice. So, I've been curious for a long little while. There is a very specific Alice in Japan. Um, you can see this at a certain period of time in a certain set of works. This Alice who looks for some unknown reason. See, she looks very distinct, right? Um, how I found it, how I founded this idea for the panel was, um, I was reading through a variety of different Alice manga and I was looking at a variety of different Alice merchandise because this was the phase I was in. What I saw was there's a lot of original merchandise, stuff that is not related to a series, stuff that's not related to an IP or Disney or anything like that. And it looks similar to, um other, I guess, IPs, I guess say. In this case, what I saw was Wonderland by Yugo Ishikara uh, and a Nendroid doll, and they just looked similar to each other. So I thought to myself, okay, this is simple, right? A lot of anime is inspired by Disney. This is just a common fact that Disney was kind of what got um, anime going. So I thought to myself, okay, so when we're looking at a lot of Alice-related uh, works, this Alice, this identity of Alice, she's gonna look like the Disney version, right? Who's that? Right? She's got the white socks. She's got the Dijon mustard hair. She has a specific shape. I mean, she almost looks a little tan. She's very stout. She has, uh, she's very small, I guess you could say. And this is really weird. I mean, if we looked here, on the other hand, you see a very pale, lanky, uh, platinum blonde, faded colored uh, Alice with striped socks. This Alice is totally different. So it got myself into a rabbit hole, got curious, who the heck is this Alice? So I wanted to go from here and talk about um, the basic history, how Alice came in Japan originally, um, what identities Alice seems to have, because in my opinion, there are few, there are a few. Um, next, I wanted to go into a very specific identity of Alice that is different from both the Disney version and the original Lewis Carroll uh, novel. Um, I wanted to go uh, talk about some other uh, popular identities, so like merchandising, um, fashion, stuff like that. Um, and I want to wrap it up. Uh, crystallize what our thoughts have been after we've learned a little bit about what Alice is like in Japan. So, let's start this off. Alice came uh, to Japan. She arrived in Japan in 1899. She was in a specific shoujo manga uh, kind of magazine that was, you know, it was there for like quite a long while. Um, what it was called was Kagami Segai, which roughly translated to Mirror World. Now, if you can guess, Mirror World is not the first Alice in Wonderland. It's the second. Uh, the sequel of the book, Through the Looking Glass of What Alice Saw There, that was the first thing that arrived in Japan that was translated there. And on top of that, it uh, had kind of a rough translation. It's like putting uh, the translation to, um, it's like going from uh, Google Translate to English type of thing. Um, there's a lot of things that translated very well. Uh, for example, um, you had the lion in the unicorn story. You had um, a sort of chess story. I'll go in that in just a second. Um, you had Humpty Dumpty and stuff like that. Your basic characters. <laughs> so true. 
Um, on the other hand, though, there was a lot of uh, themes and a lot of ideas that were either melted down or uh, taken out. Um, or otherwise. <laughs> True. Uh, canine input. Um, there was a lot of themes that were translated into Japan in a cultural sense that were different. One of the biggest things that really stood out to me was how the Through the Looking Glass is based a lot on uh, chess. So on the other hand, there's no chess in Japan, at least not yet. Um, so what you had was shogi. Shogi, of course, is not chess, but it's very similar to chess. Um, but that doesn't totally translate perfectly well. For example, Alice turns into a queen when she gets to the end of the story or the end of the chessboard. So this is entirely taken out in Mirror World, um, the original translation, and instead, um, what we had was um, Alice essentially running from Oni um, until she woke up from her dream. Uh, now, the second translation, I'd actually like to get into um, what the cover is. So, uh, what the image see, uh, what we, the image we see there is as uh, the 1910 tra translation. Um, a lot has changed. Alice is um, a lot more reminiscent of what the common uh, school child looks like during that time for example short hair was kind of in style in the early 1900s so alice was a short-haired uh school girl basically um a lot of things also changed there uh for example um when alice uh was growing larger growing shorter stuff like that um during the caterpillar scene there was a reference to a specific kind of japanese myth the uh obake uh, which Essentially, it's a thing that its neck extends. So in this case, during that translation, 1910 translation, her neck extends instead of her getting larger. Mm -hmm. um, so there's a lot of interesting things that kind of change. Another example is the name of Alice. The reason why it's called Aichan no Yume uh, Monogatari is because her name isn't Alice. Her name is Aichan. Mm -hmm. Different. A lot of interesting things that I find fascinating where um, when Alice meets the road in Japan, um, a lot of uh, the fairy tale aspects of Alice, uh, some of the metaphors get boiled away, some of the um, rambling that Alice does, especially when she's going down the rabbit hole, changes uh, either to it's taken out or it changes to various uh, Japanese myths. So, um, what I want to go into is uh, what Alice you see as a result, um, what sort of Alice adaptations you see. In my opinion, uh, this boils down to about three different interpretations. Uh, there is the Disney version. So there's a lot of adaptations, this also happens in the West, where they won't feature characters like the Duchess, like the Griffin, like the Mock Turtle, that you'll find the original Lewis Carroll um, story. The Lewis Carroll story has a plot line where Alice meets up with a duchess. Uh, she's very obnoxious, but she has to go to the queen's court because apparently the duchess stole the queen's tart or something like that. That is, in my opinion, kind of a basic way we could understand um, Lewis Carroll's Alice in Wonderland. This is different, of course, in the Disney version. Alice is kind of going through uh, her own story, um, seeing various different characters, this is also true in the Lewis Carroll story, but there's much looser kind of exploration of Alice just trying to get out of her um, dream, I guess you could say. So that's the other uh, inter that's the other interpretation of Disney, and then you have the Lewis Carroll version where the Lewis Carroll is much more faithful to the original story. Um, now with that, as I'll, as I'll explain later, I've noticed whenever you have the Disney interpretation, for example, when adaptation goes off of um, when adaptation goes off of the Disney version, you'll see the Alice presented looks more like Alice from Disney. But when you see an adaptation uh, that's based off of the original Lewis Carroll book, you'll see that lanky Alice, platinum blonde hair with the striped socks. I'll go into this more. Um, Disney plotline, for example. So 1993, uh, there was a Hello Kitty version. Um, very basic, uh, essentially... She uh, goes through this, she uh, sees the door, um, right? She goes down the rabbit hole, she sees the door, uh, she drinks the potion, gets smaller, 
Susan's a mistake because she has to get the key. She gets bigger. She uh, starts crying, stuff like that. She meets the caterpillar. Then she meets the queen. And she has a little scuffle with the queen. And then she wakes up from her dream. That is Hello Kitty in Wonderland, 1993. There is uh, Sakura from Cardcaptor Sakura in Wonderland. So this actually aired in 1999. Again, um, it's much more focused. It's, I mean, it's ultimately more focused on the story of uh, Cardcaptor Sakura. Sakura is, of course, trying to capture a cloak card, or at least use a cloak card. Cloak card. This time, it's for her making uh, making her larger, making her smaller. And uh, Alice in Wonderland was much more of a vessel to describe um, these cloak cards. So you'll see uh, the Queen of Hearts again. Um, you'll see the Mad Hatter. You'll see the Cheshire Cat. We don't really see much more elements, and it's much more boiled down. Finally, we're on High School uh, Club. This aired in 2006. Um, this is the 13th episode, so somewhere more in the middle, I guess you could say. Uh, main character, Hard He, uh, she falls asleep, and she finds herself again. Um, she falls down uh, some sort of, technically, some sort of area in her school. Um, she accidentally breaks a vase. Uh, she gets smaller. She gets larger. Um, she finds herself in a pool. She finds Cheshire Cat. She finds uh, the Mad Hatter. Um, she goes on trial. Uh, there's a queen that basically does a lot of corrupt stuff because that's the queen. Um, simple thing, Disney uh, plot line. Basic stuff. She doesn't even have any sort of um, uniform arm on or anything like that. Um, next thing's next. The Lewis Carroll in... Hey, um, am I lagging, by the way? You might be lagging. Let's double check. It's yeah, okay if I'm lagging. Lag. I just want to make sure. What's up? Yeah, there's a little bit of lag on the stream. A little bit of lag. That's okay. I just want to make sure. Yeah, I seem to be freezing right now. A uh, little bit of a frozen thing going on. So, I guess I'll keep going on. Uh, if everyone can still... Yeah, cam frozen. That's what I've noticed as well. That's fine. Um, if you can still hear me. Um, I'll go quickly into the Lewis Carroll inspired houses. Now, this is very fascinating. CL in Wonderland. Um, CL actually has uh, the design I was talking about. Striped socks, um, lanky figure, washed out clothing, that kind of thing. Um, and the plot line is you have the Duchess, you have the uh, Griffin, you have um, all the characters from the original Lewis Carroll, uh, Lewis Carroll story. Finally, you have, Nina, uh, you have Nunnally in Wonderland, uh, which is another faithful adaptation. It's kind of like a visual novel. In other words, there wasn't much animation, but there was a few picture slides, there's backgrounds, and there's characters that were kind of talking to each other throughout the entire time. This is fascinating to me because it is inspired off of the Lewis Carroll story. However, right after um, the, the Duchess was introduced, um, the Mad Hatter's party, so the March Hare and the Dormouse came in, um, interrupted the story, they left, and then at, afterwards, the story just pivots into um, through the looking glass. So in other words, Alice meets up with the deer. Now the deer is a character that just kind of shows up randomly in the sequel um, through the looking glass in this forgotten forest. She's kind of there. Um, then afterwards we see Tweedledee and Tweedledum, which you'll also see in the Disney version. But um, on the other hand, uh, it's much closer, this plot line is much closer to the Lewis Carroll story because then you'll see the carpenter and the walrus. Um, you'll see a Humpty Dumpty, which is a Alice in Wonderland kind of thing, but for the sequel. You'll see the Mock Turtle and Griffin. Um, you'll see all sorts of weird characters like the Lion and the Unicorn. It's a very weird adaptation. So in some sense, it's a faithful adaptation, but in another sense, it's kind of a weird adaptation, I guess you could say. Finally, I want to go into a much more strange category. So this Alice, um, so there's Alice in Murderland, right? Um, Alice in Murderland is where you'll have a character named Stella um, who the author explicitly said she's inspired off of um, the original Alice Little, uh, the actual person of Alice. She actually had brown hair and not blonde hair. Uh, but she has an alter ego named Bloody Alice. So you'll have, you'll have some sort of weird mental health thing going on and you have uh, some weird, like, oh, I've been here before type of situation. Uh, now, this Alice is, is not in Wonderland. This Alice is in some sort of private property, and it's 
a story that's kind of like a battle royale where Alice is fighting her various siblings, her adopted siblings. They, her other siblings, some of them are based off of Alice in Wonderland. A lot of them are based off of other fairy tales. Um, so this story is just kind of weird and all over the place. Alice in the Country of Hearts, again, there's a lot of violence. Uh, there's a lot of suggestion like, oh, you've been here before. There's a lot of like, oh, I'm kind of a strange person or I'm a passive person in a strange land. Uh, same thing is true with Are You Alice? Are You Alice is where, um, now if you look at the cover of uh, Are You Alice, uh, that manga, uh, there's actually a guy. So the guy, um, he's an incarnation of Alice. Uh, he has blonde hair, blue eyes. Uh, he has a white and blue outfit. He seemed to be, uh, yep. yeah, freezing. Um, so you can fix that. I'll keep talking. Yeah. Um, he uh, is, he's kind of just it gets thrown in here and doesn't really know what he wants to do but he feels like he's been here before he feels like he um doesn't totally belong he's trying to fix a wonderland that is broken um so there's a common theme through a third category in my opinion where you have a lot of alice's they feel like strangers in strange lands but they are either weird they're, they themselves, instead of being normal Alice, instead the normal Alice being um, a curious character who just questions a lot of weird characters, um, they're weird characters in a weird plot trying to save an otherwise broken Wonderland. Uh, I'm going to see if I can move uh, the slide to the next one, if I may. Uh, okay. Yep. So, Alex, you could say that there in the early 2000s, there was a bit of a tonal shift to a yes. much more darker, edgier interpretation of Alice. Yes, we could see this a lot with heart, uh, with um, excuse me, Alice in the Country of Hearts, uh, Are You Alice? Um, we can see this in um, a variety of, I mean, Pandora Hearts and stuff like that. All of them uh, focus more on the violence. A lot of them focus more on uh, the mental health of Alice. Uh, a lot of them focus on just something different, I guess you could say. So, in my opinion, um, and on top of that, when I was researching, uh, there is other scholarly articles that I agreed, and there was other, you know, more uh, journalistic articles that I agreed. Hey, I think American McGee's Alice actually inspired um, a different shift into Alice. Yeah, this seems to be the beginning of a dark Alice. Um, we don't see Alice with striped socks earlier than American McGee's Alice. We don't see a weird Alice in a weird plot line trying to save Wonderland, the general plot line being, oh, I'm trying to save Wonderland, that kind of thing. We don't see that any earlier than American McGee's Alice. Um, we don't see um, an Alice who feels like she's been here before, like, oh, this is not my first rodeo. We don't even see that in Through the Looking Glass. The original Lewis Carroll story is just kind of like, Oh, uh, this is like oh, this is my time in Wonderland. Hey, Dina, my cat. This is what I was doing yep. in Wonderland. That was what the original sequel was like. Whereas in American McGee's Alice, you have characters saying, "Oh, you've been here before. Oh, we know why you're here. You know why you're here. We know who you are. Um, that kind of thing." And you got to save Wonderland. Um, you don't really see that earlier. You don't see that um, anywhere else. So, uh, in my opinion, um, there's a I've few I've somehow lost audio on Discord. What's up? Uh, keep going. Okay. Uh, um, can you hear us now? I've, uh, I can no longer hear you via Discord. Okay. Yeah. Got you. So you can only hear us through no. uh, the panel. Interesting. Okay. Uh, that's fine, because you'll be coming up in a little bit. Should we uh, close the call, open the call? Uh, we certainly can. Uh, one second, I think we can get the camera back. Okay, yeah, take your time then. I'll just wait. Um, well, just hello folks, we're currently that. experiencing a little bit okay. of... Okay, so camera's back. Camera's back, hello friends. Uh, let's see here. That should still be... Uh, that should be fine. Uh, we're going to restart the call. Testing. Can you oh, hear me? There we go. Cool. We're good to go. Okay. So, in my opinion, there's a few pieces of evidence that show um, just the sheer popularity of um, what um, 
American McGee did, in my opinion, uh, to um, audiences in Japan. First thing I'd like to show, and this is uh, one thing that one of the uh, journalistic articles kind of uh, mentioned, is actually about Kingdom Hearts. So, Kingdom Hearts came uh, came out in around the same time as American McGee, uh, 2001, versus uh, American McGee coming out in late 2000. So, in the early beta trailers of Kingdom Hearts, what you don't see, which I find very fascinating, is you don't see Wonderland. Now, Wonderland in Kingdom Hearts 1 is... Um, a very early world, right? It's something where, um, yeah, it's a pivotal place, right? I like obviously it's not a place where like all the crazy plot stuff happens, like Traverse Town or whatever. But Wonderland, it's just a perfect parallel to Kingdom Hearts. You have the Queen of Hearts, you have hearts, you have doors and keys and locks, and you have all this whimsical type of yeah. Okay, so it's the second world, literally right near the beginning. Not included in a lot of trailers, but not all of them. Some of them do include uh, Wonderland, but there's a lot of trailers that just don't. It's very strange. And the article that I read did go into this. Like, okay, here's a beta, here's a beta trailer. No Wonderland. Here's another trailer. No Wonderland. But when you see trailers, especially in America, and trailers that come out later, you'll see Wonderland. Obviously, this doesn't prove anything, but it just seems weird that such a a, a world that would make it would just it fits together like peanut butter and jelly uh wonderland kingdom hearts they're just a lot of elements that would make this the perfect world for disney to show off uh and say hey you want to see kingdom hearts you want to see what it's about here's wonderland it's not there and it's not there until after american mcgee comes out so i find that interesting in my opinion at least so let's back up um let's look at the timeline again just to see where everything is and to see if yeah this lines up or not now the timeline um there's not uh there, I, there's not everything in there um there are a lot of adaptations and translations of of uh, Amer oh, alice in wonderland in japan the wikipedia article literally says there's about 1200 there's a lot there's hundreds of translations. There's all sorts of adaptations throughout the years, throughout the decades. Um, I can't cover all that, and we'd be here forever. So I just wanted to go into the, the first translation that uh, went to Japan, 1899. Uh, the first translation of the first um, uh, Alice in Wonderland story, 1910. Now, as far as I understand, the Disney movie was translated in 1953. Keep in mind, the original movie, Alice in Wonderland, uh, from Disney, came out in 1951. Now, there was a show in 1983. It's kind of much more of like a kid's show that's like, hey, here's Alice and her, fr and her friends um, going through Wonderland, solving basic friend trouble, stuff like that. This Alice doesn't look like Alice. She doesn't. She wears a red dress oftentimes. She's very, she's a very strange looking Alice. Um, now there's kind of a, uh, there's one Alice in Wonderland OVA that was made by Clamp, so same people who made Carcaptor Sakura. Uh, this is in 1993. Um, it's a Disney parallel. Um, I don't know. It just kind of, it's kind of a basic thing, I guess. Sakura and Sakura uh, from Wonderland. Again, it's a Disney uh, Disney adaptation because there's more elements based off of the Disney movie than the original Lewis Carroll book, 1999. Then, uh, American McGee's Alice came out in 2000. So, afterwards, you had stuff like Rose and Maiden, which I'll go into, get into later. You have Pandora Hearts. You have uh, the Orin High School uh, Club adaptation. You have uh, Alice in the Country of Hearts, which is an Otome game. Um, you have Alice in Borderland, Are You Alice, CL in Wonderland, you have Bibliomania, which I'll get into, you have Alice in Murderland, you have everything, you have all these different Alices, um, and there's plenty of Alices before, but the difference is these are a lot darker Alices, these are a lot stranger Alices, and a lot of these Alices are much more broader. I feel like, I've noticed, there's a lot more Alices that go off of the original Lewis Carroll story. There's a lot more Alice's that have the Duchess. You have a lot more Alice's that have Alice adaptations that have the Mock Turtle, the Griffin. Just a lot more that goes into um, Lewis Carroll's story. So um, this is kind. Of, this kind of wraps up what I'm talking about, right? Uh, 
there are plenty of adaptations of Alice in Wonderland before American McGee, but a lot of them follow the Disney timeline, right? It follow. Some of them have Humpty Dumpty. Some of them, uh, excuse me. Some of them have uh, Tweedledee and Tweedledum. That's what I meant to say. Sorry. A lot of them don't have the Duchess. A lot of them are much more, you know, basic, straightforward Disney stuff. Later, after American McGee comes out, you'll see Alice with striped socks. You'll see Alice with, um, you, you'll see Alice with a, a variety of different um, characters that you'll see from the Lewis Carroll story. You also see a lot more Alices that are based off of like. Um, uh, darker themes, Alice's that are returning to uh, a previous land that she used to go to, uh, Alice's that, are ha that have to save a wonderland that was broken. Another thing I find interesting, now I'm going to pivot a little bit, is that a lot of these articles talk about fashion. So the scholarly research that I looked into, right, a lot of college papers, a lot of them go into a particular form of fashion. Um, they just, they put it together like bread and butter. I think the the correlation's half and half. I'll get into this, but a lot of different scholarly ar scholarly articles, even anime and even journalistic articles, go into Lolita fashion. So, what is Lolita fashion? It is a counterculture movement that started in the '70s that um, had a lot of different elements of Rococo fashion and Victorian fashion um, that. Um, kind of not really over the top so much as they had different elements that were usually more involved than most other forms of fashion, right? Um, oftentimes, now, as we could see uh, on the right graphic, that's kind of the average. Um, now, what it would be called is a coordinate uh, instead of an outfit. It's a coordinate. Um, but that's kind of the average outfit of someone who's trying to go for Lolita fashion. Uh, so these coordinates, they're called coordinates because uh, someone finds a theme, someone finds an idea, and they coordinate around it. So various accessories, head accessories, um, skirts, blouses, uh, socks, shoes, Mary Janes usually, stuff like that, and purses and stuff like that. This all comes together, and they're coordinating for a specific theme. So when it comes to Alice, and when it comes to the connection between Alice in Wonderland and Lolita, every uh, article kind of comes up inconclusive. Now, one article where uh, basically someone for the college uh, research, um, she went to Japan. She went to the or, or uh, the origin place for Lolita fashion. Now, it's a specific place in Tokyo, Shibuya. It's called Harajuku. Um, there's, I think, a few different buildings there. They're basically like malls that just have tons and tons of different brands, and a few of them are Lolita. That's where this originated. That is where you can find a lot of Lolita brands. Um, so she went there um, and she asked around. She interviewed 23 different people and she was like, hey, what do you think of Alice? Do you know Alice? Uh, do, you think there's a connect do you think there is a connection between Alice and Lolita? And people usually says, yeah, um, but they usually give very, you know, uh, pass off answers. Usually answers that are just kind of like, I want to get out of here. I really don't care. I really just, I'll, I'll give you a bone, but I, really, I, I, don't, I don't see the connection. So uh, this, uh, this person, when she was researching, when she was interviewing people, she went to various clothing brands that were usually labeled as Lolita, and usually they just gave very simple answers, right? And you'll see this online, too. You have people that go back and forth and like, yeah, I guess there's a connection, but it's not totally there. The reason why. Lolita fashion is a fashion. It's very akin to punk, where punk is a DIY style. It's very much made for um, a sort of message, right? It's not made for a cosplay. It's not made for a costume. So the problem between Alice and Lolita is that when people think of Alice, they think of the character Alice. They don't think of the symbol Alice. Now, the symbol Alice would be stuff like locks, keys, uh, striped socks, um, I guess mushrooms, uh, I guess caterpillars, butterflies, um, queen of hearts, playing cards. You get the idea. There's a lot of symbols that make an Alice in Wonderland that allows you to think of Alice in Wonderland. These symbols are things which people have made tons of coordinates around, but on the other hand, have not exactly, um, they wouldn't say that they want to be Alice, right? 
it's it would be inappropriate to say when someone is inspired in making a coordinate a lolita coordinate out of alice in wonderland it'd be inappropriate to say oh you're just like alice they're not alice they're not trying to be alice they're trying to have a theme based on the symbol of alice in wonderland not even alice herself this gets even stranger in my opinion the, the connection gets kind of weirder where if we look at it again we look at the uh, right side uh, right side um graphic we could see that this uh, every element right alice alice has a um, head accessory she has a blouse she has an apron dress um she has the socks she has mary jane's she has every element that makes lolita fashion so alice herself i i it kind of seems like what a coordinate would look like in the early days of lolly fashion like the early 2000s so there's a lot of weird connections now how this connects back to my main point where in my opinion alice mania kind of started in american mcgee um a lot of nerdy subcultures uh kind of exploded with alice themes alice ideas and alice adaptations this exploded in my opinion after american mcgee released in japan you could also see this tracking with lolly to fashion so there's a whole database right it's called lolly library um it contains not everything but um tons of submitted um articles accessories and dresses of clothing um that are related or connected to lolly to fashion it's fascinating there's just there's stuff there's endless amount of accessories that you can find all the way back to 1970 the first result you get that is connected to Alice in Wonderland, the first thing that is tagged to Alice in Wonderland is actually on the left. It's from 2001. Keep in mind, American McGee came out in 2000. Maybe, there's, there's maybe articles of clothing, there's maybe Lolita accessories and stuff like that that came out before him. But the, the largest, like one of the largest databases for Lolita fashion doesn't have anything before American McGee. And on top of that, again, every single scholarly article I went, there was one star scholarly article I went into, I researched through, that just all in, beginning to finish, all 50 pages of it was just about um, Lolita fashion. Um, that one specifically, if you look at our research tab at the end, um, that would be... Um, Masafumi uh, Manden uh, being Alice in Japan performing a cute girlish revolt that just goes all into Lolita fashion. So other people are connecting these things together and other people are uh, uh, putting these two things together. Um, I'm looking and seeing that there is a correlation. Uh, people on Reddit is saying, yeah, there's kind of a correlation. There's a lot, of, there's some sort of connection between these two things. And on top of that, the connection only begins after American McGee. So, um, we can go into more of the symbol of Alice, um, if we'd like. And that's for you, Gabe. Yeah. So, one thing I've noticed while looking over Kata's research is that there very well could be a sort of um, exoticism of Europe and, and maybe just this Victorian time uh, just in a very similar way that we have with samurais, ninjas, and anime for Japan. Alice is typically seen as a stereotypical British uh, British name for any characters, uh, as well as commonly associated with such things as gardens, tea parties, modest, more girly behaviors. So there very well could be a connection with a sort of um, a romanticized depiction of the Victorian era era for the for the Japanese. And what's interesting enough is that this could lead further back into the merchandise side of things. Oh, is where if we go to the next, if we go to the next panel, you see all these. If we go to the next panel, we could see all these different designs. I believe one of these is from an actual game property, but m most of these are just a generic sort of Alice design that are clearly popular enough and sellable, marketable enough to be actually created and sold to a wide audience. Yeah. 
Um, so looking left to right, um, a lot of these are new, not all of them. Uh, left one, um, I mean, most of them are original. The one in the middle, right? If we look at the Nendroid in the middle, um, we can see uh, she's actually from a Mahjong game. Very fascinating. But otherwise, uh, the Nendroid doll that actually came out um, in... that ca uh, The Nendroid doll uh, came out in 2020, so kind of new-ish. Original design, again, as I said earlier, nearly identical to other Alice uh, IPs, other Alice properties and stuff like that. But like, not related to the Disney Alice, which I find fascinating. Um, there is a Kupochi. Um, Alice, you can see that more on the right, uh, the second from the last. That's similar to Nendroids. Uh, Nendroids, of course, are little chibi um, figurines. Kupochi is very similar, uh, just chibi figurines, stuff like that. Again, original character. Uh, totally on the right side is um, a uh, part of an original series. Uh, about nine figurines came out for it, and five of them related to, were related to Wonderland. Um, original, but that's an Alice. Uh, one before that, that's another Alice. All original. There's a lot of themes, lots of original Alices that somehow they look very similar, right? So, uh, finally, I want to get into, before we get into final thoughts and stuff like that, I want to get into things that are not Alice. So, um, I've been talking about Wonderland by Yugo Ishikawa. Um, that's actually what inspired me to make the panel because she... Oh, I mean, look at her. She has a design where we've seen in other properties. That is Alice, by the way. And that Alice does appear like that uh, many times throughout um, this manga. Um, it's just fascinating that she appears in this way that doesn't look like Disney, but she looks like something else that we've seen a few times before. So uh, going into what isn't um, Alice, I guess you could say, is Wonderland. It's a, it's an apocalyptic story. Basically, everyone turns tiny one day. And our main character, which is your average schoolgirl, she meets a girl named Alice. Kind of eccentric, kind of hard to talk to. Um, but she has an Alice dress, and she calls herself Alice. Um, and everything around her, there's something about the story where people get larger, people get smaller. Um, and people are kind of coping with this horrible reality, this apocalyptic reality. Like, people are trying to escape cats and ravens and birds. It's a very fascinating story. It's very short. It's only uh, six no uh, six volumes long. Um, and it came out kind of recently. Uh, I think it started uh, coming out around 2015 or so. Um, now, secondly, I'd like to talk about Bibliomania. Bibliomania is a self-published um, manga so it's kind of hard to find. You can't really find it. I mean, you can find a Spanish translation of it. You could find a. You can't. You cannot find a official uh, print release in J a Japanese. You also cannot find an official English release. Mm -hmm. Kind of weird. The description always calls itself a dark depiction of Alice in Wonderland. I don't see it. Right. What happens is you have a uh, a girl named Alice. She's blonde. Um, in a purgatory-like place, talking to some sort of snaky-like demon um, who says he's excited for a tea party. So this Alice doesn't want to have none of it, so she uh, goes through various doors to try and escape this purgatory-like place. She meets various characters um, who, you know, ha talk about a lot of modern issues in Japan. I guess you could say um, the connection's much more in the animation. So there's a 23-minute animation where you see an Alice that looks kind of more like Alice. I mean, that's basically what she looks like, right? Uh, kind of looks like Alice. Um, but the story just doesn't track, right? So what's going on here? Um, otherwise, another popular uh, entry when it comes, like, whenever I was researching, like, hey, what are some popular connections to Alice in Japan? People talk about Pandora Hearts. So Pandora Hearts is pretty old. It came out around 2006. Um, it's a it's an average Victorian story, right? It's this dude. Um, he's on the right side. His name is Oz. Uh, he's coming of age and is becoming uh, the head of his family, right? He's the heir of his family. First episode or first entry or first volume, I guess. Him is his coming of age um, party. He meets a girl named Alice. That's girl in the middle. Um, she's uh doesn't look anything like alice 
Um, she's kind of a weird, edgy character. She seems some, she's some sort of like spiritual entity, I guess you could say. She's trying to find her memories, um, but she can turn into you know, the r ways that she relates to Alice in Wonderland is um, she's pocket watches. She turns into a big bunny thing. Um, there's a, a lot of uh, motifs in the show of uh, various dolls, old toys, stuff like Victorian toys, stuff like that, and it's in a Victorian setting. So there's connections there, but it's not totally there. It's strange, right? It's an Alice character in an otherwise not Alice world, not an Alice in Wonderland, I guess. Finally, I want to go into Rosen Maiden. Rosen Maiden was another highly comparative uh, work to Alice in Wonderland. I'm iffy. The reason why is because it's not a plot line related to Alice. So Rosen Maiden is where one uh, like one day a Hikikomori, so a guy, a shut in, doesn't go to school. Uh, mail orders in uh, this thing related to dolls. Um, he decides to, you know, uh, circle like, yeah, I want this doll, I guess, off of a newspaper, and he gets a doll. Um, this doll explains, hey, we're participating in this thing called the Alice game. That's the connection. Um, and uh, apparently they try not to duke out, duke it out. They try not to get into a fight over this Alice game, I guess because um, these dolls care about each other um, but otherwise the only other connection to Alice even though you see a lot of journalistic articles talking about the connection between Rose and Maiden and Alice in Wonderland the only other connection is a character named Laplace which is a white rabbit and some other Victorian vaguely Victorian uh, symbols motifs stuff like that but overall it's just eh um, so what you have is I uh, you have connections and you have this common character who just gets dropped into settings and allows people to fill in a lot of details about a character. They'll more or less get to characterize a character without having to say much of the information about them. Now, So um, for a lot of Alice as aesthetic, you could say? Yeah, a lot of Alice as aesthetic, just like what you're saying, Gabe. You will get to see this especially in a variety of different times when Alice is just a name. For example, there's a character named Alice Margatroy. She is a character in the Toho Project. The Toho Project is an arcade shooter game in Japan. It's been around for a while. You have a character who has some Alice motifs. I mean, she has the outfit, sort of. Um, when she first appeared, the first game she appeared in, you'll see uh, cards. You'll see she's in a Wonderland, I guess. But then when she makes further appearances, you just don't see connections to... Alice beyond what's already been established. There's a character in Shin Megami Tensei. Uh, she's kind of like a demon, I guess. She's an Alice character. She's like a Victorian type of character. The Victorian ideal. Um, the most recent entry I could think of in terms of characters named Alice is from a Magical Girl anime that actually just came out. Um, you have a character named Nero Alice. Um, again, uh, the only uh, kind of similarities between her and Alice is that she kind of has the outfit. She kind of has the look, and she has a lot of like Victorian toys, I guess you could say. But otherwise, it's just not, it's just not there, right? So that's pretty much it. Um, those are things that are Alice. Those are things that are Disney Alice. Those are things that are Lewis Carroll's Alice. You have things that are American McGee's Alice, and how American McGee really um, impacted Japan, and at least in my opinion. Um, and you have things that aren't even Alice, and you have things that are. Um, merchandise related to Alice. So, yeah. Um, I think that uh, a lot of authors are inspired by other authors. I think that although they might not say it, I think there's a lot of inspiration from one author to the next of different various uh, concepts and um, symbols. You have an Alice with a faded outfit, blonde, long blonde, platinum blonde hair, black bow, um, kind of lanky, striped socks and black mary jean sues she appears in a lot of different works of media i find it fascinating um otherwise uh as we've seen there's a lot of characters a lot of alice's i guess you could say where um that alice doesn't it, like a lot of her characterization is hinging on the fact that hey we know her as alice and we assume that she's uh she's gonna have all these victorian toys She's going to be uh, a fan of tea parties. She's a blonde character, that kind of thing. Um, and that kind of goes along with, hey, 
when we have uh, when we have a character like Alice, or when we have like Victorian toys, or uh, tea parties, or locks and keys and stuff like that, that um, makes you think of other design cues, right? So um, otherwise, we could see uh, right from the beginning of the presentation what Alice originally looked like. I mean. What I found fascinating is one of the first translators, uh, first first translators, was actually a Buddhist monk. So, the person who translated uh, the first um, Alice in Wonderland, uh, not Mirror World, but the first Alice in Wonderland, is a Buddhist monk. So, um, some authors uh, have translated Alice's, a lot of authors, but not always. And on top of that, when they do the translation, they will incorporate. Sometimes they'll incorporate the local culture. Sometimes they'll take out metaphors that just don't translate well. Sometimes they'll replace uh, things that are with similar things. I th find this fascinating. Another thing we could also see is, and this uh, actually came from one of the other articles I found. There's actually a um, live presentation, a video presentation. Um, someone described an interesting connection between Alice as a child's name. So there are us, there are people in Japan who name their children Irisu or um, other forms of the name Alice. There's actual uh, children's naming books that have various different ways of how you could pronounce or how you could say Alice in different, uh, you know, different kind of pronunciations, I guess, different spellings. Um, I found that interesting, uh, just the fact that this is how, this is how far, uh, this is how much of an impact that Alice in Wonderland has made onto Japan. And finally, just to crystallize it all, I just find it interesting that people use these larger, grander concepts, the Victorian era, an entire span of history, bundled up into a single character named Alice. That's usually what people do. I mean, that's what happens in Pandora Hearts. We can get a vibe for Pandora Hearts because there's a character named Alice. Uh, we can get a vibe for, like when you see a character who's British, and blonde, her name is Alice. We get an idea of what this character is like um, through just the fact that her name is Alice. Um, and this translates uh, from work to work to work. I find that interesting. Now, oftentimes, usually these kinds of symbols, they'll arise on their own. I mean, uh, like, sure, you have the Disney version, but that's not always what arises. American McGee uh, arises, and people take a lot of inspiration from that, stuff like that. And when you do have these symbols overlap, it makes a very interesting result. So, I think that's pretty much it.